singing. Welcome, family and friends. You can be seated. Uh, wait, we're going to read our scripture, page 627. If you grab your blue Bible, we're on page 627. We're going to read Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. As you're be seated, as you're being seated, I have a few announcements today. Um, you, the connection cards in your pews are there for you to use. Um, please feel free to take one out, whether you're a member or a guest. You can write a prayer request on it. If you are not receiving weekly emails from the church or you would like to be added to the one call system, we are currently working on updating our systems, so be patient if you're not getting calls. It's not because you got dropped off. It's just because there's a few hitches in the get up. So be patient with the system. Uh, but this is for you all to use. If your, your information ever changes, please fill it out and just drop it in the box at the uh, back of the sanctuary. Also, there are several ways to give if you have any uh, Difficulties with that, do not hesitate to ask. We'll be happy to work through that with you. The church still takes cash and checks, so you're welcome to drop those in the box as well. Um, baptisms, we are having Baptism Sunday in two weeks. That'll be on July 24th. The baptistry is ready, right, Jim? <laughs> we, we prayed the Holy Spirit take care of that. It, it went from one problem to the next problem to the next problem, but we are good to go. So if you have not um, followed in Believer's Baptism and you would like to do that, we are having a, we are planning a wonderful day in two weeks, and we would love to invite you to participate that, in that. So if you're interested in the Believer's Baptism, please fill that out on the connection card and drop it in the box or reach out to Pastor Todd. He'd love to um, 
include you on that Sunday. Um, tomorrow, it's obvious, tomorrow starts VBS, and we are so excited about um, the ways the Holy Spirit is going to work through all the volunteers to reach this community and the children for the glory of our, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if you have not invited your neighbor friends, um, please do so. Um, I'm going to share, Sharon shared with us this week, she had some of the little cards that Todd had printed up, and we still have plenty of them, so if you need any, just ask. But she was driving, and she saw a little neighbor kid, and she stopped and she gave him a card and invited him to VBS. We should all be that bold. It doesn't take a whole lot to just invite a child, but they love these opportunities. And since we haven't been in person for a few years, it's a great opportunity for our church to reach out to the community and just love on those children the way God would like, like us to do. So as, um, as I get ready to pray, I'm going to have the new members from the new members, Todd's new member class recently, come on up to the, um, the uh, front here um, while I'm praying. So uh, Margaret Prickett and Nancy McDonald and Glenn and Yvonne and Cheryl Haynes. Cheryl Haynes. There she is. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, we just love you and thank you for all the ways that you bless us. We just ask that you... Um, protect the leaders of VBS and just give the volunteers the energy to keep up with all the children and may we be a light to this community and to the children that, that come into this building to participate in Vacation Bible School. May we uh, just be your vessels and love on those children the way you would have us to love on them. We praise and thank you. Amen. Good morning. Becky is going to uh, greet each one of our new members. She's going to anoint them with oil, which reminds them that the only way to live out this new covenant that they're a part of is by God's Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. And uh, we're so glad that they're here. Would you give them a round of applause and acknowledge them this morning? Yes. So we had... Glenn and I, when we came three months ago, we had three major goals, is that on Easter Sunday, we would reach 150 to 200 people that God would bring them here for our church, and we had 234 on Easter Sunday. The second goal was to keep 100 people in summer while everybody goes to the lake and everywhere else and uh, uh, those kind of things, and until the students come back. And so when the students come back, it's a different life, a different energy. And so we've averaged 105 people. But one of the other goals was, was to have 20 people, even in the summer, join our church. And so we have taken uh, 40, almost 40 people through the new membership class. Most of you were already members, and so you acknowledged your commitment here. But then some became truly new covenant members, and they are right here in front of you. So I just want to introduce to you, and I want to make sure I say their names right, Glenn and Yvonne Vaccaro, is that right? All right, Nancy McDonald, and Nancy's there on the end, Cheryl Haynes on this end, and Margaret Prickett. We are so glad to have you, yes. Let's pray together, Father. Thank you that these people have committed themselves because of your grace in their life to love you with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength and love their neighbor as themselves. That they will financially give here, that they will serve here, that they will pray for this church, that they will be uh, contributors and uh, not just consumers. Father, that they will have a witness in their home and their work, wherever they go, that they are followers of Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, that they believe in him with all their life. We pray they'll be complete in Christ in everything. They're already complete in you by what you said about them, just like what you say about us, but we pray they'll completely and totally live for you in all areas of their life. They are some of our greatest missionaries in this community. Thank you, and thank you for what you're doing here. There are 10,000 reasons and beyond to bless you. So now we bless you with song. And God's people said, amen, amen. amen.
So I was reading in my devotions this week, and uh, I came across this verse, and you know, I'm sure I've read this verse before, probably like many of you. I read verses, and then I read them again, and it's like I've never, I've never seen that, or maybe it just strikes me a different way. But in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says this, and it reminds us who we are as the church. It says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that, here's what we're to do, you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So as we continue to worship together as a church, I want us to take some time to praise him right now who called us out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Sing with me. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing. Would you all stand together as we continue to sing? And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise
Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I improved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him. Oh, dear God, we want to trust Jesus more. As we gather and grow and go as a church family, give us the grace we need to know and love and trust your son Jesus more and more. And it's in his great name that we pray. Amen. Would you turn and greet someone real quick? Just say hello, a shake, a fist bump, a, a hello. Just say hello to them. As you're going uh, back to your seats, no one said anything about kissing. Gail. Gail's looking at me like, I wasn't talking to you. It's a, uh, <laughs> you didn't even hear me, did you? You got to turn the hearing aid up. So we, we were, um, where were we, Gal? We were driving around, and we drove half the time, and then you told me you couldn't hear real well. You'd been nodding, and I thought he was really interested in me, and he said, oh, by the way, I can't hear real well. So I don't know if he was interested or just being polite. But they did a study that 90% of the people who sat close to the front lived to tell about it. So if you ever want to come closer, anybody, that 90% lived to tell about it. So it is good. Now, we are in a study. If you're joining us today, we're in Proverbs. So if you have your, your copy of God's Word. Would you take it out, a Bible or phone? We're in Proverbs looking at how Solomon is discipling his children, his sons. He didn't do a very good job of living the faith. He does a good job teaching the faith because God gave him the words. But he is going to tell them some ways that he messed up and some things he wished he'd have done different. And one of them is about finances, about wealth. Now, we've been talking about different subjects. And coming up, we'll talk about friendship. We're going to talk about anger. Lord willing, we live that long. We're going to talk about different subjects out of Proverbs. Now, remember, as you turn there, this is not promises. Promises are guarantees for right now. Like Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. The context of that is Paul being beat up and being mistreated. He said, I can endure anything if God's with me. I can go through anything if God's with me. Now, these are not promises. They're not prophecies. Prophecies are guarantees for the future, right? In Thessalonians, Paul says, soon the sky will split open and every person will see him that's ever existed. 
and he will take his people to be with him in the heavens and we will be with him forever. That's a prophecy. That means it's a guarantee for the future. Just this week, it's one day out of the year, over 99% of the earth is in sunlight. Do you know that? And they say the earth's not flat. No, and it's not flat, but 99%, it's a miraculous thing. There's one day out of the year, 99% we're in sunlight during the day. The Lord, though, will have no problem showing every person that's ever existed who he is when he comes back. Well, that's a prophecy. It's a guarantee for the future. It could be today, but it's not right now. It could be five seconds from now, but it's the future. But a proverb is a principle. It is not a guarantee. It is a principle to live wisely in a broken world. What does brokenness bring? It brings darkness, chaos, and uncertainty. It brings darkness, right? There's, a, there's lies around. The Bible talks about darkness being lies. It, it brings hurt and pain. You could add that in there. It brings a lot of things, but it brings uncertainty. There's some decisions that we'll make that we just won't be perfectly certain. We have to make the wisest decision we can make knowing God's character and his word. And this is how you do it, Solomon said. You, you take some principles that God gives you and you apply them into your daily life. Now, my journey had nothing to do with financial stability. We went bankrupt when I was in high school. My dad sought to make a multi-million dollar deal. I came home one day and he had explained to me that everything we had, the company, the house, everything, it was gone. I had nothing, my, my past had nothing to do with financial stability. Matter of fact, no one taught me any financial principles till I was about 30 years old. It was just do the best you can. If you were to raise your hand here in a second, how many people were taught basic financial principles, retirement, giving, serving with your money, uh, put a little bit up for a rainy day, uh, pay off your bills early, how to use your Discover card, how to balance your checkbook back in the day. Remember when they had checks? Some of us still have checks. How to balance your bank account. Raise your hand. Did somebody teach you by middle school to do that? Did somebody teach you by high school? Okay, a little more, about 10, 12 people. Some saying that. It's one of the things that we've left behind in God's economy, and we, we've left it to other people. But Solomon is learning now. He's saying, I, I made billions. He was a billionaire. He had everything. But he lost the kingdom. The kingdom falls apart under Solomon. Israel divides, breaks up. The enemies take over Israel because of David's foolishness at the end of his life and Solomon's foolishness. And one of the things he regrets is he did not teach his kids about money, that it didn't belong to them, that they are stewards, not owners, that it belongs to God, that you don't get to keep anything, but you can send it ahead of you. The only thing you get to keep is what you send ahead. And when somebody buys into that, they live differently. And that's what he's going to tell them. A friend of mine who's baptized hundreds and hundreds of people, he said, unfortunately, most of the people I've baptized kept their wallet out of the water. They, they, their body went in the water, but their purse and their wallet stayed out of the water. And they said, you didn't baptize my money. That is unfortunate because right now today, statistically, we're told that the average person who says he's a Christian gives 2% of their money to anything. Now, that's a tragedy. But you know that's not true in China. It's not true in Afghanistan or Iraq. It's not true in Africa. Richest nation on earth. There's something wrong. Well, that's where Israel was. They were the most blessed nation on earth, and there was something wrong. And so he's teaching his sons about finances and wealth. So number one, on your note sheet, on your screen, honor the Lord with your wealth. Now, we're going to start by turning. We're going to preach the gospel to ourselves. Turn to someone and say, honor the Lord with your wealth. Just turn to them right now. Honor the Lord with your wealth. I'll say it to you. Honor the Lord with your wealth. That's the key of everything. The joy of making money, the joy of making money is that we get to honor the Lord with our wealth. We get to honor him. This is, uh, I've shared with you, I've been a part of six rebuilds or church starts or church plants. And one of the things that every church starts uh, has a problem with is resources. You don't have enough money. 
in the beginning. You don't have enough people. You often don't have enough land or building, which is not our problem. When I, when I bring my friends here, they can't believe the opportunities we have here. It's just the building, the gymnasium, the land. It's incredible. But one of the things that Solomon learned is he got locked in. David, under David, the kingdom grew six times larger in Israel. But then Solomon realized he was locked in now by his enemies. And God tells him something very simple. He says, you could have had everything. But the problem is you spend it on yourself. You spent your life, your women, your buildings, your time, you spend it on yourself. And so now he tells his sons, honor the Lord with your wealth. Look at Proverbs 3, verse 9. Proverbs 3, verse 9, if you got your copy of God's word, honor means make much of or lift up. Make much of the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your produce. Now that's interesting because now they're automatically going to have to live in faith. If they give the first fruits of their produce, what if a storm comes? What if the enemy comes? What if insects come? What if disease comes? So they're to give right away of the first fruits of their produce, Israel is, and not worry about what comes later. God says, I'll bring your crop in. I'll keep your enemies away. I'll take care of you. And if I don't, I have another plan anyway. So they have to give, they're called to give their first fruits of their produce. Verse 10, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vases or vats will be bursting with wine. Now, again, a lot of, a lot of people, unfortunately, a lot of people on TV, I won't name their names, they'll use the Old Testament and some of the Proverbs to say, if you give a dollar, God will give you 10 back and that kind of thing. That's not true. Or they would be giving us all a dollar, right? When Congress investigated them, 10 of the wealthiest televangelists, they were on average worth of 50 to $100 million dollars. They were putting money in Swiss bank accounts and making uh, uh, false companies to hide their money that God's people gave them. There's something wrong there. But Israel had a principle, and it's true much of the time. If you give, God will give you more because you're a vessel of giving to give to other people. It's a true, it's a true statement, a principle. Notice that they can drink wine. Most of the world drinks wine and now called differently than we do. The Puritans stopped where they did. A big part of it was because they were out of beer. Nobody had water back then, right? You, you didn't drink water. You didn't drink water much in Israel. I just want to tell you a side note. Alcohol's meant to be a beverage only. If you can't drink it as a beverage, you need to put it down. That's what the Bible's going to say. And here he says, I'm going to provide for you food and drink. They, if they could drink water, it might have been water. It doesn't matter. Here's the goal. I will provide for you what you need if you follow me. If you follow me. Doesn't that sound like Matthew 6? Honor the Lord. Lift your name up. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Then you ask, now give me my daily bread. There's no reason to have daily needs. If we're not going to live to honor God, if we're not going to do his will, if we're not going to live for his kingdom, there's no reason for him to provide our daily needs. And so that's what Solomon is telling, telling his sons. R.A. Criswell, some of you remember him, the old Baptist preacher. I think it was 1960-something he said this. He said he came across a friend he hadn't seen in a while. He had discipled him for years, and he'd heard that the man had become very, very wealthy. And he met him, and he said, how are you doing spiritually? How are you treating your wife? Are you growing your kids up in the faith? Are you, are you giving faith? Are you serving in your local church? And the one question that bothered the man is, are you giving faithfully? And he said, uh, Pastor Criswell, uh, you know I've become a very wealthy man, and I can't tithe now like I used to. That'd be, that'd be way too much money, and I'm not quite sure what to do about it. And Pastor Criswell said, well, I know what to do about it. And he said, what? And he said, well, let me pray for you. So Pastor Criswell puts his hand on his shoulder, and he says, dear Lord, would you make my brother poor again so he can be faithful to give to you? So isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? It does not matter how much we make. It doesn't matter how much we have. The principle's the same. I'm going to turn one more time to somebody and say it. 
Honor the Lord with your wealth. Turn to him right now. Honor the Lord with your wealth. If you walk out of here today and you say, what was that sermon about? You say, it was about honoring the Lord with your wealth. That's going to look different in everybody in here. There's no legalism anymore. There's no percentages anymore. The New Testament says give generously, consistently, and joyfully. Generously, consistently, and joyfully, sometimes sacrificially. The Old Testament, you had to give three tithes, not one, three. So when people talk about tithing, they often don't even say what God told Israel. They had to give tithes. Here's what I learned about tithing. It's way too easy. You give something aside, you give something amount, and you just say, the other nine dimes, we taught our kids, unfortunately. We said, here's one dime for you, uh, for God, and nine dimes for you. Well, they took it literally. They went out and bought Barbies and all kinds of stuff. I, we, did, we, we were wrong. We didn't know better. The Bible says all of it belongs to God. If you give a certain percentage to your local church, by the way, God says give three places, your local church, missionaries, and to those in need. Your local church, missionaries, and those in need. You always provide for your family, but you give to church, missionaries, and those in need. But all of it, all of it belongs to God. Here's the hard thing. Here's the spirit-led thing, is to stay on your knees and say, God, how can I honor you with my home and my car, and my business, and the money you gave me, and the breath you gave me, and the time you gave me. That's a harder thing. It's not a percentage. It's not like you check it off. All right, fed the dog today, gave a percentage, kissed my wife, I'm good till evening. You can't do that. No, no relationship works that way. Everybody say amen. Solomon learned the hard way. He learned the hard way, and he's telling his sons to do different. One more thing before I go on. Thank you. You have responded to us in three months so well in so many ways. You're so generous with your encouragement, your words, your prayers, your giving, uh, the way you've jumped in on things and served in all kinds of ways. Thank you. Uh, the world will see our response together to live out the gospel. Second, our wealth reveals our hearts. Our wealth reveals our hearts. It can shape us, of course, to make a lot of money. We know that. Or to lose money. But really, more than anything, money just reveals what's in our heart. Jesus said, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. By the way, the Bible says the reverse. Where your heart is, there will be your treasure. What you focus on enough will become your treasure. And vice versa. Chapter 10. Look at chapter 10, verse 16. Chapter 10, verse 16. Again, I hope you see this, may want to mark it up. I have studies if you want to take anybody through these. I have questions for you. You can disciple people with them. So we're just going through Proverbs and just taking our time to learn what he says about subjects. Here you go, verse 16. The wage of the righteous leads to life. The gain of the wicked is sin. So if you took parallel passages and you looked at them, it explains it a little more clearly it's this, that when a righteous person has wealth, they help other people have life. They provide for women's care centers to provide for children. They feed people. They use their money to make a difference in the world and get the gospel out. They, they, they produce life. But an ungodly, unrighteous person takes what God gives them and produces death. They use it up. They spend it on themselves. They waste it. That's the whole, it's a big theme through the book of Proverbs. By the way, one of the verses you know, Romans 3.23, the wages of sin is almost the same phrase here. Sin brings death. To misuse things brings death, he says, he tells his sons. But the righteous use what they have for life. In Luke 16. Jesus pulls his disciples aside and he teaches them a parable about giving. And then he teaches them principles about giving. And some of those phrases you know very well. You cannot serve both God and money, mammon. And then he tells them that they are to be wise 
in their spending and their giving and their serving. They're to grow, they're grow wise. But then he says this phrase. He says, if I give you worldly wealth and you misuse it, how could I give you true riches? Isn't that interesting? So would you write three words down? Write three words down. Here's what money is. It's a test. The Bible says money is a test. It's a trust. It's entrusted to us to make a difference. It's a test. It's a trust. And third, it's a testimony. It's a testimony. And so he looks at them and he says, hey, everything I'm going to give you from here on out. One of them was very wealthy. Two of them were because they had multiple boats. In their day, they were very wealthy. They had multiple fishing boats. They had a company. They, and the rich young ruler came to him. He was a multimillionaire. It didn't matter whether they had a little or a lot. didn't matter. He said, it's a test. It's a trust. It's a testimony. He said, but if I can't trust you with the things of this world, which are going to disappear, how can I trust you with true riches? What is true riches? Look around you. There they are. True riches is relationships in the kingdom, people. It's discipleship. It's making a difference in people's life. He says, if I can't trust you with true riches, I can't trust you with the deeper things of life. Have you ever seen a generous person that wasn't joyful? And again, who builds statues to misers and greedy people? Nobody tells testimonies about them. Says, you know, I love her. She was the most stingiest person I ever met. She really, she really made a difference in my life. The way she took everything out of my room and kept everything from me. Nobody talks that way. So he looks at his disciples. He's headed to the cross. And he says, he talks about money more than heaven, hell, or marriage all combined. And he says, I want to tell you, boys, one thing that's going to challenge you is if you do well in this world. Be careful. If you do well in this world, be careful. Because it could get your heart. Keep asking me how to use it, and I'll show you how to use it. If I can't trust you with the worldly things, I can't trust you with deep riches. Well, the first people, it made a difference in Erie about our giving. Uh, he died and left us a, an amount of money. He raised eight kids in an 800-square-foot house. One bathroom. That man was a saint. So he died, he, he mowed our yard, he mowed our yard. When we started the church, we asked everybody in the former church that it had fallen apart, they were fighting and all those kind of things. We asked them to take a year off if they would and pray about whether they wanted to come back. We were gonna go a different direction. And everybody did, but the one man, he said, I don't have to come if you don't want me to, but I'd like to mow the yard. He was a World War II veteran he went, out, he went in in Germany to do the cleanup. He was with a cleanup squad and saw terrible things. He was a hero. And he came and he started attending the church and he mowed the yard, a very humble man, and gave his $10, insignificant, whatever it was. I can't remember what it was. He actually told me what it was and told me why. He was, he was saving for the future. And then he died. And he left us an incredible amount of money just as we were starting two churches. He said, I want to, he told me before he died, he said, I want to make a difference. I didn't know what he meant by that. I went to his house, saw him a few days before he died. He said, I want to really make a difference. And he said, I want you to know that. He was telling me in a nice way. He didn't want to tell me about the money or how much he was giving. But he was one of those men that when you saw him, you'd probably say, hey, do you need a couple bucks or, you know, a cup of coffee? You thought he was just broke. And he'd worked a very average job for 50-something years, had saved money. You hear about these stories over it. Had saved money, and he said, I want to give it to my local church to make a difference. Well, four months later, five, five months later, we started two churches on the same day, and we went over the hump financially because of his giving. That happened to us three times. Another situation, a person gave us a building. Another church gave us another church. And each one of those, we used it as the, the beginning of a church that we started. Now, God can do this in many different ways. But most often what he does is move somebody's heart to say, oh, that's me. 
or that's us. And the money that came in over time, $10, $20, we did a build for life. We ask everybody to give what a pizza cost. Back then, I think it was $8, something like that. It's like $72 now, something like that. But it would be a little different. <laughs> It'd be different now, like, you know. So we said, give 8 to $10. We had 100 people sign up for that for, let's just say, $10. And most of them, after we started the church, kept giving. You know what people give to? Vision. We're going to make a difference in people's lives. So right now today, I just got told there's 80 kids coming to BBS. Susie, who's been here quite a while, a few years, she says we may have that many people sign up that day. So we're going to have 100 plus, maybe 200, I don't know, 150, 200 kids in this building in VBS, learning about Jesus Christ. Your giving, it, it makes a difference. Notice one more thing. Write this down again. I'm going to make sure you hear it. Generously, would you write it down? Joyfully and consistently. Generously, joyfully, consistently. You talk to God about how he's to lead you to do that. Third, generosity creates blessings. If we give generously, it creates blessings. 11, 24, 11, 24. The word generosity in Latin comes from those of noble birth. So the people that depended on those of noble birth would say, thank you for being generous, for feeding us. But in the Bible, we're the people of noble birth. We thank God regularly, right? He provides for us and he provides to us to give to other people. Generosity creates blessings. Verse 24, one gives freely yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and he only suffers need. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched. Whoever waters will himself be watered. Now that's true of all of life. Encouragers are the fun people to be around, right? The people who serve. And the people who give. Those who water will be watered back. That's true of all of life. The most generous person you know, think about them for a minute. Think of the qualities they have. They usually love God deeply. They trust God deeply. They love people. They want to bless and encourage and give. That's what produces their generosity. It's out of their heart. Jesus said everything comes from the heart. In Matthew 6, he says something interesting. He says, don't store up treasures for yourself. He didn't say don't store up treasures. He said, don't store them up for yourself. Because the next phrase is, store up treasures in heaven. And here's what he said. There's only two ways to have treasures. One's on the earth when it will be destroyed, rust, moth, ruin, and one's in heaven. There's two types of treasures, he said. Don't do the one, uh, do the other. Now, everybody has to work about that, has to pray and think about how much do I really put aside for the future? How, how do I save for a rainy day? All of that's true. But he said the danger is saying, okay, I'm going to live like this is all I've got. I'm going to store up treasures for here. And he said, don't store up treasures for yourself here. Store up, store up treasures in heaven. So I told you, Four months ago, that Glenn and I would give out of our will uh, when we die. Any of you remember? I prayed for you to ask that I die first, right? Because it's not going to look good if she goes before me. It's just not going to look good. So if, when we die, we're leaving something behind. We're going to ask you to pray about the same. And here's why. We want to hire a youth pastor. We want to hire a children's leader one day. We want to make a difference in our community and beyond in different ways. July 2nd, when we were out giving away gifts and meeting, we met three, 4,000 people. It showed me what really can happen in this community. It showed me what can happen. When you do a rebuild or a restart, one of the things is a church that struggles, we talked about, you disappear over a while. You just disappear in the community. Well, we're appearing again. We're, we're coming out. People see, people hear, people know. And what's going to happen is, as people come in, they're going to look for life. And one of the things that we want to do is give for life. You can't make any bigger bang for your buck than say, I'm going to invest in kids. 
and I'm going to make a difference in, my, in the youth that come behind me. I may not see it, but I want kids to play here one day. I want them to bang into the wall where we have to paint the walls every week. That's part of the problem. Everybody say amen. We're not going to complain. <laughs> we're not going to complain about kids hurting the gym. The gym needs to be fixed up, but we're not going to complain about it. Because if you walked in there and it's pristine, you know what's not happening? Nobody's in there. Hey, I got a three-year-old boy. I got nothing good or sacred in my house that's out in the open. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> I mean, nothing. If he don't break it, he busts it or burns it down. So that's okay. It's okay. So this, this calling... This calling is to say, how does God want me to speak from the grave? How does God want me to speak to other people from the grave? How can my life go on my legacy? Boy, Solomon messed up there, didn't he? Number four, faithful working is our greatest wealth maker. This is a principle, by the way, that's true still today. Me faithfully working over a lifetime is the greatest way to make wealth. Some of you remember Larry Burkett. Larry Burkett gave a statistic. He taught finances before Dave Ramsey. He, he said if the average person would keep working from 65 to 75, from 65 to 75, and only gave just, uh, he gave a certain amount of money, gave $50 a month, $100, it wasn't much. He said if every Christian would do that, it would result in hundreds of millions of dollars in the kingdom. That is staggering. One of the things that we want to think about is how do we work over a lifetime to some degree and give faithfully and serve faithfully? And that changes, by the way. By the way, we only make, we only have a certain amount of time that's prime. It's only a certain amount of time. But he says our faithful working is our greatest wealth maker. Chapter 13, verse 11 Chapter 13, verse 11, he says, Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. Do you see that? If you, if you seek to get rich quick, most people lose it, he says. Now, there's always an exception. You run into someone that bought Bitcoin back in, you know, whatever, 90, and they bought 10 coins, and now they're worth a gajillion dollars, and you just, by the time they tell you, you don't want to hear it. Or they bought Amazon or back in the day. They're, they're the, called the one percenters. Everybody say one percenters. They're one percenters. But the principle is I work over a lifetime. I put a little aside. I give some away. I serve. I care, I care for my family. And over a lifetime, I make a bigger difference. I get debt free, and I work, and I serve, and I give. Number five, spiritual wisdom is better than worldly wealth. Solomon now is getting to the place in his life. He says, I wish I didn't work such long hours. I, did, I wish I wouldn't have been gone from my family so much. Proverbs 16, 16. Proverbs 16, 16. How much better to get wisdom than gold... To get understanding is be chosen over silver. He doesn't say either are bad. He just says if you have to choose one or the other, choose wisdom over making a lot of money, working overtime, being away from your family, all that stuff. Now remember, wisdom is hakma. It means to be a craftsman. It means to be able to take the word and put it to practice. He says, learn to put the word to practice and go hard at it. Chase hard at it about knowing God and knowing his word and living it. A friend told me this week, the difference between knowledge and wisdom is this. If you have knowledge, you know a tomato is a fruit. It's not a vegetable. But if you have wisdom, you don't put the tomato in the fruit salad. So that's a big difference. Knowledge is one thing. Wisdom is saying, oh, that's how you want me to do this. That's how you want me to save. That's how you want me to serve. That's how you want me to give. And so that is wisdom. So chase hard after it. Number six, he says financial planning provides more wealth for us to enjoy and use generously. We are to have planning in our life. 
We let the Lord direct our steps, but we do plan and pray. Proverbs 21.5. Proverbs 21.5. Solomon is big about planning. He reminds his sons to pray and to plan. Verse 5, the plans of the diligent lead to abundance, but everyone who's hasty comes to poverty. Poverty. So here's five questions I ask on a regular basis. Glenn and I go over our, we have goals for each year. We pray. We go over our budget. We pray constantly. We ask each other, how are we doing? What, what's the next step? How are you led to give? So here's the first question is, how much am I making? So just say it out loud. How much do I make, okay? How much am I making? Number two, how much am I spending? Say it out loud. How much am I spending? So we need to know how much we're making. We need to know how much we're really spending. Number three, how much am I giving? Say it out loud. How much am I giving? So we want to look regularly and say, how much am I giving? Is it generous? Is it steady? Is it consistent? So how much am I making? How much am I spending? How much am I giving? Fourth, how much am I saving? So let's say it out loud. How much am I saving? So we want to save a little bit for an emergency fund, for a rainy day if we can. And then fifth, how much am I leaving? Say it out loud, really loud. How much am I leaving? What am I leaving behind to make a difference in other people's lives? What am I going to leave? What am I planning to leave to make a difference in the kingdom? So that's our questions. We ask them, and that's a part of saying, Lord, how do you, how do you want to direct our lives? So we worked after years of my foolishness. We worked on paying off my bills, our bills, which were my bills, and then we started snowballing bills, and then we got them paid off. We got debt-free. Here's what we discovered. When we were debt-free, we could give generously. We could even buy Girl Scout cookies. Like I started buying 12, 13 dozens, and it was for the Girl Scouts. It was, it was, it was for a good cause. You could, we gave to the adoption center near us. We gave to the city mission. I began to serve in the... Uh, Erie City Mission, I began to serve in the overflow shelter. And I'd go at night when people would be checked in and stay there with the men. They'd come off the street. In Erie, uh, you have to have it. Two people died the last year we were there on the, on the street. They froze to death. You got to have the shelters. And so what I began to give to, I began to be interested in. I began to serve. And so with Glenna over the years. And so this is a principle that's really true. If we ask ourselves, how do we get financially stable? It's not to be financially stable. It's to be a kingdom person in a greater way. Two verses on your screen. Proverbs 27. Let's read it out loud. You ready? Know well the condition of your flocks and give attention to your herds for riches do not last forever. You got to know what's coming in. You got to know what's going out so that you can save a little, give a little, and leave a little. Here's the second one. You ready to read it? Proverbs 22, 7. The borrow is slave to the lender. I got tired of giving my money to the banker. And if you're a banker, I love you. I just don't want to raise your kids. I got tired of paying more interest paying more interest than I gave to my local church. I started totaling up the interest we were given to other people that could be given to God's people. It wasn't good. It took me years to work out of some stuff, but I would just encourage you to work out of it if you, if you, if you can. By God's leading, I believe you can. This is a great reminder, isn't it, from Solomon? And finally, I most glorify God when I'm most satisfied in him. I took that from John Piper, but I think I know he got it from the Bible. I most glorify God when I'm most satisfied in him. I think this is the most interesting verse in the Old Testament. Not, not most meaningful, but it's the most interesting. Proverbs 30, verse 7. Just say, got it. Encourage me. Two things I ask of you, Deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. So stop right there. He said, I want to be a man of truth all the time. I want to live in the truth all the time. 
I want people to say that's a man of integrity. That's a woman of integrity. If she says it, she means it. If she means it, she says it. He said, I, I want to be known as a man of truth. But look at the second one. He says, here's what I also want to ask you. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I get full and I deny you. And I say, well, who is the Lord? I don't need the Lord. I got a credit card. I'm doing quite well. Why would I have to pray about that? Isn't that a danger? This is thousands of years ago. I'm, I'm concerned, he says. I could get too much. And I'd start saying, I don't need to talk to you so often. I, I'm pretty sufficient. Here's his second worry, concern. Or that I become poor, it means dead poor, having nothing in your pockets, nothing, and I steal and blaspheme the name of my God. Don't give me too much. Don't give me too little. Isn't that something? I want to be satisfied in you, so just give me what I need, and I'll use it. Just give me what I really need. I'm, I'm in the shelter. Last time I'm in the Erie shelter, and I'm with a lady. She's 84 years old, getting ready to turn 85 years old. And she's just an amazing lady. I could go on and on about her. But in comes a man that she knows. 11 o'clock at night, staggering in, uh, looks really rough. So the way she speaks to him, I could tell she knew him to some degree. I said, has he come here often? She said, no, I've never seen him. I said, do you know him? She said, oh, yeah, I know him. She said he used to be one of the wealthiest men in this city. She said he had a red convertible and had rich black hair that went back. She said, I imagine that David might have had the same kind of hair. And she said he was one good-looking man. And inside, I'm thinking, you go, girl. I mean, you're still talking that way at 85. You, you go, girl. You're kicking your boots on all the way to heaven. And he, he walks in, and he is nothing, nothing like he was. You would never know it. So I ask her, what do you think happened? His desires. That was her reply. His desires. I don't know what all that meant. Women, money, things. It's tough. But I don't know. But she knew. Got the best of him. Don't give me too much. Don't give me too little. You know, people that pray that kind of prayer, they're really just satisfied in God. Just That's the Lord's Prayer, Disciples' Prayer, isn't it? Give me what I need. Just give me my daily needs, my daily bread. I, I don't need too much, but I don't want to steal. The joy of making money is to honor the Lord. So, Last thing, last thing on your, on your screen, two bookends. Honor the Lord with your wealth. Here's the second one. Have as many friends in heaven as you can. Have as many friends in heaven as you can. Luke 16, 9. Use your worldly wealth to benefit others and make friends. And when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you into an eternal home. Just, you got to do this. Turn to somebody and say, that's great. Just say, that's great. <laughs> Isn't that great? He, he's going to the cross. He's going to die. He's heading home. And he says, hey, boys, one more thing. How many friends you want in heaven? How much are you going to speak the gospel and how much are you going to give into the gospel and how much are you going to pray in the gospel? I hope you have a bunch of friends that welcome you at the gate and say, thank you. You know how they'll know? Because Jesus said, in heaven, you'll be known as you're known. You, you will be knowing as you're known. He's going to make it clear. I used him to reach you. Go talk about it for a million years. I used her. I used this church to touch this community. He's going to make it known. And he says, I will celebrate it in front of everybody. I wonder if that's right before he takes 
his place to wash our feet again, which is an amazing thing. He says he'll serve us again. He'll serve us food and minister to us. And he'll look at us and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter the joy of your master. What's the joy of your master? Having the same heart God has. To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. To want them in eternity as much as you want to be there. To want them in heaven as much as you want to be there. Father, thank you. We're going to change up our song here and sing Trust in Jesus. And we're going to say that we trust you and we acknowledge it in front of everyone, the angels, the spirits, heaven, but especially in front of you, that we trust you to build this church up for your glory. We ask that you use us, our time, our service, our encouragement, our finances, our words of life, our gospel conversations. Use us. Each week, Father, as we drop money into the boxes or we give online or whatever, I pray that we'll start praying really faithfully, oh God, reach the next person. Who's our one to reach? Who's our next person to reach? Reach the next one. We trust in you to do this. As we sing to you, as we celebrate you, as we honor you, do something here, Father, that everyone in this community will say, the Lord did that. The Lord did that. Would you sing together with me? Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you. How I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust him more. Would you stand together? sent people. And as he sends us this week, remember to honor the Lord with your wealth. And also this week,